welcome Susan Jacobs. Uh, Susan is director and chief of Dr. Agarwal's Refractive and Cornea Foundation in Chennai, India. Susan, thank you in the, uh, for joining us. So, thank you. thank you, Carlos. We want to to ask you about the situation right now in Chennai and how are you living this COVID infection and the resources you are taking about? Yeah, so um, Carlos, you know, India has a very unique position in uh, being, a, you know, a, a large country with a huge population. Uh, our first case had come uh, at the end of January, and that was a patient that was actually a medical student, a group of three medical students who had come back from Wuhan, and uh, one of them had turned positive. And that was in a state, it, in actually my home state, Kerala. I, I practice in Chennai. I've been a resident of Chennai for uh, many, many years now. But I'm originally from Kerala, and this, uh, these, uh, these three students were from Kerala. And the Kerala government, I must say, managed it beautifully. They quarantined them and everything was because uh, that Kerala government had experience with the previous virus outbreak uh, uh, last year, which was the Nipah virus. And they were very good at it. They already had the entire experience. It was managed very beautifully. And since then, we've uh, intermittently been having infections uh, reported with patients, mostly with a travel history uh, or contact with someone who's had a travel history. So the community spread uh, I don't think uh, has happened so far. It's not really sure to say about that because the number of testing that is done is limited, but, uh, but uh, hopefully, and that's where we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we have still not reached that pace. Now, uh, uh, the government response has also been very good, uh, right from the state government where I am, and uh, that is Tamil Nadu and the central government, they've basically, uh, I don't know whether you've heard about this, but uh, on Sunday, we had a curfew for one day, which was appealed to by our prime minister and the entire nation completely followed it. Follow, this was followed on Monday by uh, a lockdown of about uh, 75 districts where there were positive cases. And uh, starting from uh, uh, today, we've had a complete lockdown of the entire country. Now this means a lockdown of 1.3 billion people. And that's huge, that is really huge. Our deaths are currently at about 50 uh, in the nation, and we've got a total uh, case count of infective cases of about 600. So we've done this quite early in our uh, in our uh, you know uh, progression of the COVID uh, epidemic in our or pandemic in our country, and hopefully, hopefully this will uh, help uh, you know control it in our country because uh, because if it goes out of hand, you can imagine what is going to happen similar to all other countries uh, you know this is of course the worldwide uh, scenario right now so is, is people taking like uh, seriously they understand how big uh, is the situation well yes yes i think uh, with the prime minister's address uh, yesterday and also previously uh, people did have kind of uh, realized the seriousness of this uh, and uh, uh, everyone is uh, following uh, the rules. Of course, there are a few people here and there, as in every country, who still do take it lightly and you know go out on the streets, gather in groups. Now they are the ones now we really need to address uh, further to and try to make them understand the importance of this lockdown. What about Agarwal Hospital? How many surgeries usually you perform by day, and what uh, what are you doing right now? Well, our uh, surgeries uh, would be around, uh, in my center, it would be around maybe uh, 60 a day uh, in all our centers together. It's going to be much, much more. Uh, but uh, we've closed down elective surgeries completely. We are running now on emergency only mode, which means we see only emergency cases. Uh, OPD as well as theater, there are no scheduled cases happening at all. And I think I really think that is the right way to do because uh, of multiple reasons, you know, uh, you decrease the number of patients coming, you're saving that precious personal protective equipment for when it's going to be needed later, you're, uh, you know, uh, 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 encouraging social dis uh, distancing and everything, everything of that which is so crucial right now. So uh, what considerations do you have right now at the, at the operation room? Do you have any special, uh, like, situation we, we haven't yet had any emergencies so far, luckily. 
we haven't yet and in our center we haven't yet had any emergencies in our uh, in chennai we have a huge number of branches so all the branches are closed and it is the main center where i work which is currently attending to emergencies so patients come here there is a triaging system right outside of course right now also there are patients who come for uh, non emergency uh, reasons as well you know uh, we we have a very uh, strict triaging system at the entry which is by the administrators and they ask the relevant questions fever cough history of travel and everything else and also try to determine if this is really an ophthalmic emergency which needs to be seen and once that is done they are uh, they come in and a history is uh, taken uh, uh, and then uh, we do a very quick slit lamp examination and if required you know any other uh, investigations that may be required so do you have any like uh, concerns between all the societies in ophthalmologies or you are just following uh, like your own system no uh, the all india this is this is a system which we started uh, uh, you know once the things started getting serious we initially started off with the smaller measures in the sense we educated our staff we educated our patients about what precautions to be taken we uh, uh, you know uh, inform them about the the possibility of it being transmitted through tears a non contact tonometry not to be done since it causes aerosolization you know even uh, you know a staff has a habit of or or all staffs everywhere i guess they pull the lid and put the drops the dilating drops or whatever so we uh, educated them that is not to be done the tissues that the patients hold which they use to wipe their hands we told every patient not to put that on common areas you know they hold it in their hand and it's likely that it touches the armrests of the chairs where they sit and all these things so all these things were uh, repeatedly reinforced to both the staff the patients uh, and even spread among our own doctors and uh, we kind of uh, settled down decreased the uh, attenders to just one patient one attender and all these things all these other measures we had started off early we also put that slit lamp barrier sheet which uh, uh, i had also put up on a video we started that sometime back dr john canlopolos had shared the first video online on that and uh, there was subsequently a video by me as well which uh, i'm happy to say uh, uh, i've got a lot of uh, you know messages saying that a lot of people did like that video and found it useful so these are some measures that we started and then we uh, the uh, we uh, you know increased it progressively as we found the situation was getting worse and worse uh, and finally you asked about our society the all india ophthalmic society has also issued guidelines uh, where you know it is kind of similar uh, cut down on your elective opts uh, in fact it's now stop all elective opts stop all elective surgeries only emergencies to be attended before that itself all cmes and all meetings were cancelled everything went if they want organizers wanted to do it it was supposed to be done only as an online meeting and uh, you know the 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 questions to be asked for the patients about the triaging system all these guidelines have again been sent out by the all india ophthalmic society as well and you know we have a huge membership it's probably one of the largest societies worldwide and uh, and i think aas has been uh, actually uh, it's it's playing a very good role uh, even uh, you know dealing with the government of india uh, with regards to the medical requirements the surgical requirements the concerns of the medical fraternity aas has really taken a very very positive stand lobbying with the government and representing the needs of the medical fraternity perfect uh, what about tele telemedicine are you doing some of that are you planning to do it in the future uh, telemedicine is uh, generally not allowed in india uh, due to legal reasons and there have been a couple of cases where the doctors were actually prosecuted for it but now in this current scenario everything changes you know it's 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 this, this i think covid has been a complete game changer in every country so uh now uh some of the medical associations of the different states of india have come out with guidelines as to which situations you can do telemedicine and uh, and how you do go about it basically so uh this this has been done by different states and i also hear now that the government has come out i though i have not yet confirmed that but that the government has come out with a with a complete protocol of what telemedicine involves and uh, what you can do via telemedicine do you know or can you recommend any application you have been using before for telemedicine or you yeah, just I think, uh, like all of us uh, 
uh, there was of course always some amount of informal communication with patients on whatsapp or on calls but we never restricted it to uh, we never uh, went down to actually advising patients on whatsapp it would mostly be how are you feeling is there redness is it you know a matter of concern please come down to the hospital we'll examine you this so this was mostly it uh, but now i think telemedicine is going to take a more serious role previously it was mostly because of the legal ramifications that it uh, implied but now that uh, the government is also proposing to change it because it it really is required at this scenario uh, i think it will be seeing much more use of it and what i see happening is probably whatsapp is going to be a very very big thing uh, where it's going to be used probably some of the associations state medical associations have suggested that you write a prescription with the history and also label it as being done in the in the present scenario of the covid pandemic and uh, then you write it down and you write down the history you write down your findings and then you sign on it and take a photograph of it and send it to the patient also saying that this has been done without actually seeing the patient physically and then file it in your uh, emr system so finally susan you have a huge amount of cornea transplantation and eye banking experience what do you think about COVID and eye banks? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. The eye bank uh, of our hospital and many other hospitals have currently shut down and they're not uh, going out to procure any more eyes due to multiple reasons, obvious. Of course, you don't know right now uh, which of the deaths may be because of COVID and you also are exposing these personnel who go out to, uh, to you know, collect the eyes as well as possibly the attenders, the patients and all those people to uh, exposure to the to the virus so uh, we are not doing any collections now though we have got some older stored corneas and scleras in glycerin uh, which possibly uh, we have uh, as usage for a dire emergency for example a perforation or something like that a corneal ulcer which requires a therapeutic we would be forced to use those preserved grafts uh, preserved uh, tissue for such cases but right now we are not doing uh, any any if no emergencies have come up and we're not planning to use the the current lot of corneas that are going to that that are in it not being harvested as well do you think in the future we'll have to change our guidelines in in procurement of corneas that is a very good question because i think uh, probably we need further scientific research as to whether this virus is also present in the cornea i'm not aware uh, that this has been done as yet. Uh, we would need to actually harvest corneas from positive patients and see if the uh, if, if it is positive for PCR or whatever, if the organism is actually present there. And if it does, I guess it, it might possibly change uh, how we do corneal eye banking. So do you have a final message to our community? Well, I think uh, it's uh, basically what is very obvious to us. Life is going to change after this. And I'm sure none of us would have thought this is going to be the case a month back, a month and a half back, that our lives are going to be turned upside down. You know, I would have, I would have much more believed that a world war actual with guns had broken out rather than a world war with viruses. I mean, not a world war, but we're all in a world war situation where, where this is something that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. So my message to all my colleagues is stay strong. We've come out of tougher situations. Humanity has come out of tougher situations in the past. I'm sure we'll all come out stay strong, stay true, and stay together. And of course, social distancing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. On behalf of the Argentinian Council of Ophthalmology, we wish you all the best and let's keep in touch. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much for inviting me.